أعوذ بالله السميع العليم من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الصلاة والسلام على المبعوث رحمة للعالمين ونصلي عليه في الأولين وفي الآخرين وفي الملأ الأعلى يا رب العالمين We always begin with praise and gratitude for all of the multiple countless favors and blessings that we live in every day and we praise and exalt and glorify the perfection that brought us into existence and we ask his guidance and forgiveness in our affairs and we ask him to send his peace and blessings and mercy upon his final messenger and prophet he sent to mankind to complete the Abrahamic covenant. We're going to be studying the uh, 21st and 22nd uh, verses of Surah Al-Baqarah. And as the Prophet وسلم, said, anytime people gather, anytime people gather in one of the houses meant for the worship of Allah, they are reciting the Quran and they are studying it amongst themselves. That the tranquility and the peace and the goodness will envelop them and God will mention them with the angels around him. This is of the most noble things we could do because this is what makes us Muslim. If you are knowing the basis of your faith, it is fully rooted in the Holy Quran. And today's verses will tell us what is the purpose of life and then give us some evidence as to why is that the purpose and why should we be so certain about the purpose of life. So I will recite for you the ayah here. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم يا أيها الناس اعبدوا ربكم الذي خلقكم والذين من قبلكم لعلكم تتقون. So just to kind of look at this as a script, you see where it says yeah, and then you see a little wavy line. That wavy line is there after a wow or an alif or a ya, and then the next letter is hamza. Okay. So if it comes uh, inside of the word, like malaika, it has to be elongated. All of the narrators of the Qur'an learn from the Prophet ﷺ that you must elongate that one. But as in this case, because ya and ayyuha are two different words, in this case if you wanted to on recitation, ya ayyuha ladina or ya ayyuha nas, you can recite it like that without elongating it, whenever it's two separate words. But when it comes inside of the word, it has to be elongated. So then you will see there is a alif after the wow. U'budu. You see that? That alif is a denoter that originally there was a noon, and that noon has been taken away because it went from the present tense verb ya'buduna and we turned it into the plural command form all of you worship okay the way that was done was the ya was taken out of the front there was an alif put there and then the nun was taken off and then the alif was put there u'budu you see how it went from ya'buduna to u'budu this is called arabic morphology so you do not say u'budu wa you don't say it like that. You'll notice that little sukun looking thing above it. Right? Sukun. That means don't even act like it's there. It really does not have any pronunciation. So, when you are reciting وَالَّذِينَ مِن قَبْلِكُمْ When there is a nu with a qaf before it, it's going to sound like مِن قَبْلِكُمْ not min qabalikum. If you said min qabalikum, you're reading it wrong. This is not Quran. This is a newspaper you're reading. This is just common error. Quran has a perfect flow to it based upon the highest 
understanding of Arabic eloquence in pronunciation and expression. It's a miraculous book for those that knew and studied this point. In the time of the Prophet ﷺ until now, many people have embraced and have been enlightened in the Quran just simply because of the text itself. And so, if it becomes uh, like minkum, you'll hear the difference minkum. When there is a big letter, qaf, da, ta, gha, ra, before or after uh, the noon that has sukun, it's going to sound like like that. Right? So this is if it's going to be like a letter that is like ta, 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 the a, the apple letters as they say, uh, you're going to hear the noon is kind of the, there's no noon because it's a, you, you're secretly, you're holding it back. Okay? So, la'allakum tattaqun. Okay? So, in this verse, yeah, it means. You, hey, listen, it is a way to call out. When the Qur'an is saying, yeah, whoever the one is being spoke to, spoken to, is, it's a very important injunction that's about to come. Now somebody might say, well the whole Qur'an is important injunctions. No, this is a type of emphasis as well as uh, Allah is talking to people in close terms, intimate terms. Yeah. So here it says, Ayyuhannas, mankind. Ayyuha is like a connector. It really doesn't carry any meaning. Annas, mankind, all people. So this verse right here is talking to everyone according to the stronger understanding of tafsir. Because, اطلاق اللغ, لا بخصوص السبب. You know, when it comes as a general statement, and you may have heard that there's a circumstance that came and somebody was being spoken to. The general thing, the Qur'an is guidance for everyone. So, we just, in the beginning of Baqarah, God answers the prayer, إِهْدِنَا الصَّرَاطَ mustaqim, Guide us to the straight path. The, pr- the crux, the climax of Al-Fatiha. Then it says, this is the book. This is your guidance you're asking for in your prayer every day. Meaning if you're praying every day, that's a great level. But you should also be reading Qur'an every day. Because that's what your prayer, its fundamental quality is, it's asking for guidance. And this is where it's being found. So then it gives you five qualities and characteristics, or a little bit more than that, in about five ayahs. Who are those who are believing? Then it says, who are the disbelievers? Two verses, very simple. When people's hearts are inclined to disbelief, God will shut them off, their hearts are veiled, their eyes, their ears. They can't see it until their hearts turn to Him. And when their hearts turn to Him, He will lift the veil and it will become very plain to them, obvious. What is guidance and what is purpose and what is light and what is darkness. But they're stuck in darkness following their desires um, while they have chosen this move. And then, He talks about hypocrites. We've spent three weeks talking about hypocrites. Because it's a big confusion about faith. It's a matter of doubts and confusion and fluctuation of faith without a deep, sincere uh, drive to come to conclusions about the answers of faith and to really check oneself from the corruptions of the inner desire and the social desire. So now here it comes, O mankind! What is he going to do? He's going to tell everyone, believer, disbeliever, hypocrite, I'm talking to all of you now. You see? He's laid out. There is no fourth. There are three categories of a person's faith. Either you are a believer, or you're a disbeliever, or you're a hypocrite. There are no, there's no fourth. He has summarized the reality of faith as it relates to human beings. This is pinpoint manual of guidance scripture in the Holy Qur'an. Now he will address them all. What's important that you all need to know? أُعْبُدُوا رَبَّكُمْ All of you must serve Worship your Lord. The word Lord here is a rough translation for Rabb. So, A'budu Abada. It is intrinsically meaning service. Does the slave worship his master? No, 
doesn't worship the slaves. The, the slaves on the earth, most of them did not like their master in history. Right? <laughs> it is very unique, the Islamic legislation that led to the interest of eradicating slavery because all these scriptures start talking about how we need to free slaves, we need to treat them like human beings, we need to feed them and clothe them and sit with them just like they're normal people. These were very strange ayahs. And these are very strange teachings that the Prophet ﷺ came in helping to regulate and to slowly eradicate uh, the concept of, of sla slavery according to divine purpose of human freedom and human purpose. Because we are all slaves to whom? Rabb. It's more important to say Rabb here. Because Allah is a word that means the worshipped entity. One that's worshipped supreme being. It's a definitive word describing the ultimate supreme creator, ruler of the universe. But Rabb is specifically referring to that he is the creator, provider, sustainer, and maintainer. These three, these three qualities. He's the one that everything came from him, and then he will emphasize that point. And he's the one that provides you with everything that you have. He's the one that maintains you. He's the reason why your heart's beating. He's the reason why everything is sustained and facilitated for you. That's the Rabb. So all of you serve your Lord. Imam Ibn al-Qayyim al-Jawziyyah, one of the great scholars, he said, Ibadah cannot be real until you really know who is your master and you are very comfortable with your master. If you don't know him, how could you serve him very well? I'll put it to you later. Imagine you're walking down the street and you've got some things that you need to do. It's not the end of the world if you take 15, 20 minutes. But then some strange person comes up to you. He's like, hey, I need you to give me some help here. Can you do this? Now, as believers of altruistic benevolence, followers of the scripture, right, we will probably try to go out of our way and struggle and strive to help that person. But your average person will do what? Who are you? I'm busy. I've got things. I'm sorry. I can't help you. Right? Now, your mother, your father, your best friend, your brother, your sister, your neighbor, they come to you. I need your help. Won't you be much more inclined to help them? You know why? Because you know them and have a close relationship with them. And this is where the fundamental problem of the downfall of servitude and devotion and worship in the Muslim world is it's because people don't know who it is that they're worshiping. They're getting an idea about God as this vengeful, angry, hateful being. I'll be dead honest with you. Those are all, whoever does this is going to the fire. Whoever said that should be killed and destroyed. People are having ideas that, you know, God is against people. And this is not Allah that we know from the Qur'an by His Asma and His Sifat and how He described Himself. So we have to go back to knowing Him. So this first statement is saying, get to know Him. And He's going to tell you who He is. Who He is so that you will realize who your Creator, Provider, Sustainer and Maintainer is. And He's for all of you. You know, each tribe had different idols in Arabia. They were tribal, very rigidly tribal. And because the Quraysh had authority over the Kaaba, they stood out as the best tribe because they had this special place. But every tribe had their own gods that they were worshipping. And in many cases, they felt like my god is better than your god. And if you go to India, you might meet some people doing this. So the one in my house, so that one has powers and yours doesn't. I'm going to go with the fam my family's God. I watched one of these documentaries and they were talking about how families have handed down and some big families they have. And then from a caste system, this one says he's God and then that one over there can't even have a God because he's not. The whole thing doesn't make any sense from top to bottom. He says, who is your Lord? Who is your Lord? Alladhi khalaqa. He's the one who created you. That is the most important thing to know about Him. Why? Because that's the beginning of everything. You don't exist, except for He has willed you. You did not deserve to be existing. You did not ask to be existing. 
you just were given the blessing of life. First and foremost, He has created you. And He created those before you. Meaning, everyone got their blessings from Him. So is it the tribe that's important, or is it the creator of the tribe? You see how he's fixing the Arab mentality back then? He's making it that it's not the tribe. The tribe has no value in and of itself because it was all created by one. And so everything that makes that tribe special was given it by its creator. لَعَلَّكُمْ In Arabic, لَعَلَّ التَّرَجِّي It's basically hope or um, expecting good things to happen. Some scholars said it's like like so that. Either way, saying if you are knowing him and you are living in servitude to him, then the natural conclusion will be that you will be doing tattaqud. You will, in the plural, all be mindful and conscious of your duty to Him and living a cautious lifestyle that protects you from the evil of yourself and the world around you. Wiqaya in Arabic is the root waqaya. This is the root of taqwa. And so wiqaya is generally historically meaning protection. It never meant fear. How many of you heard saying well, taqwa, how many of you heard people saying like it means fear? It does not mean fear. It means to be careful, to be cautious, but it does not mean to be fearful. There's no way you can understand that from this word. It means to take measures that will protect you. From what? From your own actions and from people fooling you around you. From the influence of evil in the world. And from your own desires and ego. That's what you're protecting yourself from. Because that's how people lose their way. Their own ego, their own desires, their own arrogance, their own philosophical ideas. Or the world around them brings them to a level of evil. And now their soul is harmed. So what is the solution to all that? Know who is God and then serve Him. And make that your most important purpose in life. So it may seem like this is something we know. But you have to look into how, what level of religiosity or ibadah is superficial? What does superficial mean? Superficial means you do it because that's what you, you think that's what you're supposed to say or do. It's not deeply, sincerely rooted in genuine purpose. It's just the thing that I'm supposed to do. The thing I've been told to do. I had a young lady call me uh, recently. She said, Imam, I'm now in my 20s, and since I was like 13 years old, I felt pressure from the women in my family who are all wearing hijab, that I should wear hijab. And she said, I feel like a hypocrite because I really don't think I'm wearing this because I truly believe in it and feel like this is my act of modesty. I do it because I fear shaming from other people, other Muslims, the females. It's interesting because they think males are the ones doing it. Across the board, I would say it's females who are forcing girls to wear hijab in the families. And so she said, until my faith and practice and knowledge in general, she's like, I'm not even really praying often. I don't really pray. But I wear the hijab because it's something that everybody can see, and so I have to fit in with the Muslim expectations. She's like, I don't believe I'm sincere while doing this. So here's what's interesting. 
Some person might listen to this and say, Astaghfirullah, what's wrong with her? Tell her, this is an obligation, you better do it, because if you don't, then you're a sinner and all that. This behavior is why she's in the dilemma. This style of advice, it's, it's not nasiha if you study the word linguistically and practically from the example of the Prophet So I told the sister, I said, I'm actually going to praise you in that you are on a spiritual journey. You're actually, at this moment in time, assessing what you're doing and why you're doing it and where is God in all of that. And for many years now, you were never doing that. So I will say, this whole dilemma you're listening to in your thought process is a level up in spirituality that you have gained. Because you're, now you're thinking about who, do you, why you do what you do and who do you do it for. This is what we call sincerity, which is the root of real servitude to God. So many people do things. Once I, I posed the question to a group of people, um, because one of the kids told me, he was like, you know, um, Imam, he had been in the youth program. He's like, my father does not ever really pray unless he's at the mosque. And he said, and I've started to pray five times a day recently, and I'm, I'm, I'm asking him to. And he only does it that I think if I'm asking him to. And he said, this is, seems very strange. And, uh, and so then I noticed that guy, because I know who he is. And after we prayed Isha one day, after some program, he prayed, mashallah, two rak'ahs of sunnah and the witr. And I'm thinking, is he doing that because everybody expects him to do that? Is that the reason why he's doing it? Because he thinks people are looking at him, and he's concerned about what that means. Because now I've come to know. I was just would be assuming everybody's doing it sincerely. As a Muslim, that's how you would think about your Muslim brother. But then after she told me about this, then I asked the sister I know. Are you all ready for all this? She is a uh, leader, a prominent speaker and things like that in California. I said, uh, sister, do you think it's common that a lot of sisters are wearing hijab and they don't really pray? And do you think that many of them were forced to wear it? She said, of course, Imam, we all know this. I, came, I, I, was, I did not know about this. I'm just assuming they're all praying five times a day and they're modest, uh, chaste Muslim women because that's how it is. Then she threw it at me and it blew my mind into outer space. She said, we're hearing of girls that are doing that and then there are things that you couldn't imagine they're doing and they're wearing hijab. And then they're meeting people and strangers and all of this. Religion should not be a cultural pressured shame fest. Religion should be rooted in sincere knowledge of the evidence. Why? should I be a devout Muslim and become convinced of the essence and the foundation of the points of this and then do it simply and solely for his pleasure subhanahu wa ta'ala if we do it like that la'allakum tattakum alladhi so alladhi means the one who so this is connected to who? where it says alladhi the beginning of ayah 22 it's alladhi literally means the one who. Who is the one? Allah. Allah. It's going back to Rabbakum. Actually, the word that it's connected with is Rabbakum. The last place where you saw Allah. He is the one who ja'ala. He has made. Lakum. al arda firashaw. So, he is the one who has made for you the earth, Firasha. Firasha can mean like your bed, where you sleep. A comfortable place to relax upon. This is Firash. Something that has like cushion. Cushion. Firash. So he made the earth a comfortable place for you. Do you know what some scholars said? I'm trying to remember the Sheikh's name. I think it's Khalid Mathkuf in Kuwait. He said, he made it a place of comfort for you. Meaning what? Meaning everywhere on the earth you can sleep and you feel comfortable? That's, that's literal. 
this ayah is talking about figurative. Look around in this room. This room is pretty comfortable, isn't it? The carpet, the air conditioning, you can feel it, right? The walls, the painting, looks nice. It's a little bit comfortable. It's much more comfortable than if we were out in the little forest here with all the bugs and the hot, hot air and all that, right? Where did all this stuff come from? And oh, He made for you. This earth, it will bring all the comfort you need. All the technology we're learning is a connection between us, our mind, and what we can do, and the earth. That's what all this technology is. Everything that has made human beings is us understanding how do we derive from this earth ways and means to make life easier upon us. So he's made the earth a place of comfort for you. So, that's a pretty big favor, isn't it? Pretty big favor. I mean, if we think about all the things we've got from the earth. So then he says, وَالسَّمَاءَ بِنَاءَ Can you say, وَالسَّمَاءَ بِنَاءَ You cannot. You can't say it like that. وَالسَّمَاءَ بِنَاءَ Because, this is inside the word, we're talking about the rules of recitation. وَالسَّمَاءَ بِنَاءَ You have to recite it like that. Why? Because this is the way it came from the Prophet ﷺ to us. That when the Hamza is following an alif, a wa, or a ya inside of a word, then you have to elongate it for four moments at least. You cannot be reading this and say, الَّذِي جَعَلَ لَكُمُ الْأَرْضَ فِرَاشًا وَالسَّمَاءَ بِنَاءً وَأَنْتِ You cannot do it like that. They would say, وَالسَّمَاءَ بِنَاءً وَأَنْزَلْتَ If you want to stop, وَبِنَاءَ Like that. This is how you recite it. This is called Tajweed. What does that mean? He made the sky a structure. بِنَاءً Structure. This is what, what we're in is a binat. It's a room. It's a type of structure. All the scholars of tafsir, this is one of the scientific miracles of the Quran. They said, what is this structure talking about? They went to Surah Al-Anbiya. وَجَعَلْنَا السَّمَاءَ سَقُفًا مَحْفُوظًا We, in the royal we, when he uses this majestic plural royal we, as one, talking on behalf of everything, the scholars all agreed that the reason why he does that is to, to indicate what he's about to talk about is some amazing action that he does. So it says, we made the sky above you a protective ceiling, a protected ceiling. Saqaf, what is saqaf? That is a saqaf. You see it? Would you think that there was a saqaf? as was back in the time of the Prophet if this was not here and you look up and you see the stars, would you think there's a saqaf there? Would you? You would not, because you don't see any saqaf. Out today, when it was nice and, you know, blue sky, when you looked up, did you see a, uh, a ceiling? You didn't see the protective ceiling? You didn't? Guess what? The consensus of scholars, it's not a theory, it's a fact of science that there is something called the atmosphere, which inside of that has something called an ozone layer. These two are functioning as a protective ceiling above us. And they protect us from a variety of things. Number one, first and foremost, is UV rays. If that wasn't there, we would all had cancer as little children. And we would have gotten very badly burnt when we went outside. Even in just uh, whenever it was 80 degree weather, because of the wind and things, that sun would have pounded on us. And we're feeling it more if you're paying attention now than when you were young. It's getting much stronger, even on a day when it's 80 degrees. I can remember when I was a kid, I used to go out and play when it was 95, and I really wouldn't get a bad sunburn. If I go out right now, without putting suntan lotion or wearing a hat, for like 10 minutes and it's 80 degrees outside, and it's sunny, I will get a bad burn. It's because we're destroying the earth. And that's a scientific fact. Whoever said otherwise needs to check themselves. Because they're, they're looking to make millions of billions of dollars for 
the fossil fuel industry. That's the only reason why they're doubting anything. Back to our point. Second thing, are you aware every year comets or asteroids, I think they're called asteroids, meteor, meteors, 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 meteors the size of a house go through our atmosphere. And do you know what they end up? Just some sand and dust that just comes down in such a way that you wouldn't even know it. You wouldn't feel it. If that atmosphere wasn't there, it would create an atomic explosion every other day on this earth. Are you aware of this? This is, not, I'm not, this is not a theory. These are facts of science. These things come periodically. The size of a car almost every day. Size of a house, like, you know, periodically. And then you have sometimes the size of, you know, this building, sometimes it comes and then it just slowly goes through the sky. And it never comes to the earth because of this protective ceiling, as well as the uh, fast rotation, the orbit of the earth around the sun and how that all functions. So he made the earth a binet. He made the sky a binet, a, a building, a structure. In the time of the Prophet wasallam, did this make any sense to anyone? Zero. Did they say, Muhammad, this uh, thing you're talking about, this structure above us, we don't see it, this is religion's nonsense. Today, if we didn't know about that, people might have said that. Because that's how we think now. Everybody was arrogant. Well, see, the beginning of this thing about who's the believer is The true believer is humble enough to know, I don't know everything. There's a lot of things that are beyond my knowledge and perception. That's the first step of being a true believer. To assume I know everything and whatever is it within my reach, eyes, ears, and all that, knowledge and background, to assume that is to assume omnipotence or omnip omniscience for oneself. Arrogance is worshipping one's brain. So he says, وَأَنزَلَ مِنَ السَّمَاءِ And he sent down from the sky the water. Where does the rain come from? It comes from God. Here's what's also interesting about tafsir. A Muslim scholar should not try to read the Qur'an as a book of science. Because as we just very clearly elucidated a miraculous statement in the Qur'an from the Creator about His creation that nobody would have known until in the 1920s and 30s. Nobody knew anything about an atmosphere or an ozone layer until then. That's when the first idea, that was a theory. It became a proven fact when they started going through with the shuttles and they saw the extreme force and all of that and they started to quantify with scientific gauges with big balloons they sent way high and all that. They did all that. 40s, 50s, 60s, then it became in the 70s, fact, there's an atmosphere and ozone there, there's no question about it, that's what it is, it's protecting us from so many things. Now, on this ayah, he sent down rain from the sky, some Muslim scholars, of great, great Muslim scholars, these are pious, righteous men of great knowledge in the religion, they said things like, some people think that clouds are the source of rain. We know that Allah is doing that from His arsh, this is what they said. I was reading the tafsir from many scholars, and they said this, many old scholars. It's not the cloud, Up above the cloud is the throne which is on some water, because we read an ayah that said that. And so God sending from His water on His throne, this rain. So we know it's not clouds. He's talking out of place, isn't he? A Muslim scholar is a theologian. Theology, the study of religion. He is not a scientist. It's not his business to talk about science because he read something in the Quran. The Quran is not a book of science. You're not supposed to go in here thinking, what scientific facts can I find in here? You're supposed to go in here, what guidance can I find? Why? Well, one of the reasons is, is because there's about 10, 15 scientific facts that have been proven without a doubt that there was no way Prophet Muhammad knew that it happened to be in here. So that's the reason why I read it for guidance, not for scientific research. The Quran is not a book of science. It was never intended to be. It would have been very strange and, and taken in a much stranger way if it was talking in terms of science. 
it was talking in terms of guidance. And then it has miracles, one of them being that like we've found many, a good solid handful of things. If you go on to like Harun Yahya, his website and some other, some people have gone into outer space, literally. They have gone overboard in the whole science in the Quran thing. There's helicopters written in the Quran. Like what? Well, look, it's on the link. And now, Alhamdulillah, Allah bless me to memorize this whole thing. I don't remember about the helicopters in there. <laughs> I don't know, Ta'ir, yani, I remember something flying in there and I, I understood that to be birds, right? This is not how the Qur'an was meant to be treated. And that makes us look stupid. Have you ever gotten that email? Here's the picture that proves that the, the moon was split. See the line? Have you seen that one? There is no line all around the moon. One time I got that sent to me while I was in Kuwait. I was like, wow, mashallah. Let me go find out because the picture looks awfully close. So I went to NASA's website. And you know what they do? They always have recent pictures of all sides of the moon. You can look in, you can look out. It's their website. There is no ring around the moon. What somebody has done is one of those, uh, what do you call those crevices? They're fault, whatever it is. I don't know what they call them. They have them, little lines that maybe, maybe cover a tenth of the circumference. But if you go in with the video, it looks like all across the moon. But you're not looking at a very small part of the moon. If Allah, who created everything, ahsana kulla shay'in khalaq, He perfected everything He created. Um, like when we come back, when we're created back on the Day of Judgment, is there going to be like big lines, like, you know, like some sort of stitching from like, you know, like when we make the little dolls and stuff? Oh, because we have to recreate them now, of course, it's going to have all these stitching and stuff. Why can't you just create it back the exact same way that it was before he split the moon. Of course, we should assume that. That makes more sense about who he is and how he does things. But people need to try to find light. Then they spread that stuff. Then they tell some non-Muslim, see, look at this email. Islam is true. And then this intelligent person says, that sounds ridiculous, goes to NASA and says, you're an idiot. This is where we need to be careful going overboard in this concept. So, Many great Muslim scholars said, it appears as though Allah causes the rain to come from the clouds. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Can Allah create everything according to billions of years of evolving processes? Yes. Be and then that's how it works. Why is to him be and is? He's not in time. Yawman indahu ka khamsina alf sana. That's just an emphasis. One said Alf Sana, one said Khamsin Alf Sana, one may be a Milyar Sana. That stuff doesn't mean anything to him. He is being it is to him. The whole thing. Your life is being it with it has already happened according to him. Creating a whole new can of work. Well so therefore he's making us do it. No, he's not. Allahu Akbar. Don't bring him down to where he has to function in time, and if he doesn't, then he's controlling time. No, he gave you full freedom and choice. You do what you do, you'll be responsible. You pray to him, he can help you out, make things easier, forgive you your sins. If you don't, he won't, and then that will all be your fault or your reward. It's up to you, whichever one you chose. You're living in time, so you have to go through it. He already knows. Is that a hard one to grasp? It shouldn't be. When we say Allahu Akbar, that means something. Stop trying to bring him down to your thinking process. You're just a little speck of dust on a planet called Earth. We're all little ants. Right. So what did he do? فَأَخْرَجَ بِهِ مِنَ الثَّمَرَاتِ رِزْقًا لَكُمْ He brought down the water. And then that water, he put it in the earth, and then that has brought ثَمَرَات. ثِمَار in Arabic literally means fruits. But what it's referring to is all the different sizes, shapes, kinds, colors, of all of the different things we benefit that come from the vegetation. Rizqal lakum, as your sustenance. Imagine if everything was just like, imagine if all was one color in the whole. Have you ever just thought when he says thamarat, many types of fruits? Have you ever thought of that red? Apple, shiny red apple, that yellow banana, the orange, the green pear, the red grapes, 
all those things. They have different colors, different sweet flavors. Subhanallah. You know, you should just like subhanallah every time you shop. And we need to teach our guys, here's what we're going to do. We are going to start, my social team doesn't like this stuff. I start throwing out stuff and I'm like, this is what we're going to do. Then they try to catch up. But this is how we do. My job is to try to bring some ideas to practice our religion. How many of you have ever heard of a garden, a vegetable garden? You make it yourself. In this community, we have three experienced people who have done it in their backyard. And I've been there, and it's big and vast. And every year they're having hundreds of pounds of fruits and vegetables coming from it. And there's no pesticides, there's no genetic, genetically modified anything, right? We have 13 acres. Why don't we do this? And why doesn't it be a community process to take your children to appreciate where did that stuff come from? That they nurtured it, and then they picked it, and then they went home and put it into the salad and ate it. To their iman, the faith will go up. This process is as close as we men can get to being a mother. And we're still very far because God chose them over us. You hear like men, what God preferred men over women. That's amazing. To experience creation from inside of you. Allah. He's chosen them for that. So we're going to make a vegetable garden, inshallah. <laughs> That's all we got. Right? But it's similar in some way. And it requires jihad and sacrifice. You have to struggle and strive to make sure you keep up with it. It's happened before where people said, let's do it. And then the committee starts with like 12 people. And then they get the whole thing started, which costs like eight, nine hundred dollars to get like a 15 by 20. I think it was 12 by 20. I saw one time. And then now, three months later, it's like one, two sisters over there. <laughs> it's like, hold on, brothers, I thought we were the one. Man, that's sister stuff. What are you talking about? The Prophet used to do this stuff. Many of the Sahaba, radiallahu anhum, ajma'een, they were the ones taking care of their garden. This is men. It's a manly thing to do. The famous story of That hatta tunfiqu mimma tuhibbun. It's one of the great Sahaba named Talha. Not, tal, not that one. The different Talha. You heard the ayah says, You are not a believer until you give that which you love. God. <coughs> he had something called Bayruha. Bayruha is a giant, you know, grapes, dates, everything. It's got wells in it. It's, it's probably, it is the biggest garden in all of Medina. This guy is a very rich guy. So he told the Prophet ﷺ, I'm giving Bayruhat to the poor Muslims here. They can take care of it. It's theirs. They get whatever they want from it. But clearly that's what he used to do. He used to take care of that. So now he says, after making all this point, I created you. I've surrounded you with favors and blessings that pro protect you, provide for you, give you comfort, give you warmth, give you everything you need. I've done that for you. فَلَا تَجْعَلُوا لِلَّهِ أَنْدَادًا وَأَنْتُمْ تَعْلَمُونَ So don't, فَلَا, so don't. فَ comes in there a lot. It's like, so what you just heard, now here's the, like, the conditional, now do this or don't do that. فَلَا تَجْعَلُوا So don't. Do you know why there is an alif next to the wow? Because there used to be a what? A noon. And then it was removed. Because the command form uh, in the negating, it takes away the noon. It's تَجْعَلُونَ Originally. فَلَا تَجْعَلُوا لِلَّهِ To translate that literally is going to sound weird. Do not claim, it literally means don't make for God. Andada. Nid is like shabih. Andaj ashbah. Something that's like it. Something that's like him. Something that's on his level. So 
someone that's on the same level as you. So don't claim or believe that there are other than God on the same level with Him, or that there are in the likeness of God other things that exist. Meaning, don't worship other than Him. Don't look at the things you got from the earth and all the technology, and look at your big giant garden and all the blessings and think like, oh, I've got that, I did that, or that's mine, or that's ours, or that thing's cool in and of itself. It is not. All that is Rahmatullah. All that is His blessings and beneficence and mercy and compassion and care and benevolence. That's all it is. It all came from Him. Tawheed is to recognize that everything comes from one source. Everything that we have, everything that we like, everything I love, it all came from one source. So don't be attached to things. Don't be attached to people. If you're attached to a person, and then you think you've lost them, it's like, at the end of the day, Allah has blessed you with that person. And at the end of the day, human beings are responsible for their soul and their choices. If they died and they're from our ummah, we're going to pray for them. And that's the way we respect that. If they were not from our ummah, we will hope the best for them on the Day of Judgment. Because they're not from our own. وَأَنْتُمْ تَعْلَمُونَ Meaning, be conscious of your attachments. Be conscious of your attitude towards creation and the things that you're attached to. The things that you hold special. The young man at the Juma, he came to me and says, Imam, I was opening up my door, and then the door opened, and then it, I think it hit your car. He's like, there's just this small little scratch and dent, but I felt really bad about it. We went over there, I couldn't even really see it. It was like some... He's like, do we have to call the insurance? <laughs> I said, you have insurance? <laughs> <laughs> so I told him, it's just a nick, you know. The car's purpose is to drive you. Even if you have a really nice car, if you're going to make a big scene because there's a scratch on it, there's something in your iman. You, 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 you hold that car in an esteem that you shouldn't. Now, if somebody totaled it and you can't use it, call it insurance. So technically, insurance is a... The, insurance system here is completely corrupt and un-Islamic. It's full of what we call gharar. In case stuff happens, I will make lots of money off of you, and I'll never provide for you any service, and that's just how it is, so pay me my monthly premium. And then whenever something does happen, not only, <laughs> now I'm going to make you pay more money than you were paying, so it's like, why was I paying that in the first place? Now you can ask for more money, and it's like you're I'm just, why am I paying you this money? Why don't you just pay for the thing and keep it the way it is, you know? And so, but then, we've veered off into a lesson of Islamic legal discourse as it relates to minority jurisprudence. So, the transaction is haram. It's sinful to go in that transaction in Islamic law. And more so for the one that's taking it, but to... Islam wants us to eradicate evil transactions by not taking part in it. But then we look at, well, what would happen if you didn't have insurance? We have to pay attention to both angles. So if I get insurance, I'm going to have the sin of getting into an unlawful transaction where I could benefit from this transaction at some point. But chances are, as a decent person with a smart way of driving and reasonable attitude, I'm not going to probably get anything out of this, right? But if I don't have the insurance, then I get pulled over, then they will find me, and they will take away my license. And then if I get pulled over again, they will arrest me for driving without, which is a crime. And then I can end up in jail. So end up in jail when you have a house to feed, 
or get the insurance because you're kind of somewhat forced to do it because in many states it's a law. You have to have the insurance. So now you have the law of the land versus the Islamic law. Pretty much this is one, I mean, maybe you could correct me if I'm wrong. As far as the laws that say you have to have it, I don't really know of any others besides this one that's forcing you to go against something in your religion. And you're not being forced to do something that harms others. Actually, you're being forced to become the oppressed. So the vast majority of scholars that I know who have studied what it means to live in America are saying you should get the insurance. Now they debated, should you get liability only, which is I think is the law, or should you get full coverage? They said if the loss, if you have a car that's worth over such and such amount, then you can get the full coverage. But if it's under such and such amount, I think 10,000, then you should only do the liability. It's also made economic sense, you know, uh, because you pay so much premium that uh, if you put your vehicle, you don't get much out of it. It's, yeah. it's a, it's a, exactly. Yeah. So the, all of that is paid, scholars of Islamic legal discourse pay attention. Now, you may have studied, if you go and check it for fatwas, particularly if you're doing it in English, you're going to get two groups that are bombarding you as though they're the only scholars on earth. Saudi and the deal bank. Those two are working very hard. You don't know the deal bank is well. Deal bank is a group, is a city in India. And what they were is when the British came and started to do colonializing, and it was obvious that the British have an intention to try to change the people to be more like them and to and to mock their religion and make their religion lesser in their eyes. So scholars got together in Dioban and said, we need to form a protective body and be very strict against these forces that are attacking our society and culture and identity as believers. So I will tell you, had I been living in India at that time in those circumstances, I probably would have joined the Dioban. Myself, I know myself how I am about things in religion. But does that apply to people living in England and America? Is that the same kind of thing? And should we make opinions that are just from the get-go anti-Western? Like that is a, you will find that feeling of a lack of any concern about what it means to live in the West. And all the scholarly implications of deriving law based upon benefit and harm and the big picture as it is per as it was re revealed in Mecca and Medina so when the Muslims were a small minority in Mecca were there all these strict laws given to them in the Quran this is a consensus of scholars who studied the Quranic sciences they said no structural social laws came until the Muslims formed their own society. And that is a divine wisdom. So scholars are looking into benefit and harm and social growth and development as a small minority and what that means and the implications and they're making fatwas on that based upon a thorough understanding of the concept of fatwa. Other scholars are overseas or living in a small little bubble here in America like they're still in some country over there, as though they don't really live here. And they're making fatwas that is like back home. And this is not proper fatwa analysis. Abu Hanifa made many suggestions about different fatwa for if there was Darul Harb or the land of non-Muslims and the uh, places where they were against us and all of that. How would you be and how that might be different? Um, but the later scholars, particularly those in the Dioban, they were very strict about, you know, as though they're still living in a caliphate, which there's no caliphate. You know. And so this is where those two groups are going to bombard you with opinions that you're going to think, this all haram and this and that and other, which I would advise you to go to somewhere like amjad.net, Assembly of Muslim Jurists of America. There's a list of like 40... PhDs who live in America on there, and then a list of like a hundred Imams um, who are supporting that project. They all live here, and they've lived here for a while. And you'll see very different fatwa style 
of them as opposed to the ones you'll get from Islam q and Islam Web, uh, Mufti.com or whatever. You're going to see those are very much stuck in a different angle. At any rate, it's almost uh, time. Any question about the, uh, the Tafsir? What was the website? I think it's uh, MJ. I'm going to send out, uh, there's a few Fatwa resources, Fatwa banks. And we will be, you know, establishing one for our website as we grow and go with things. And sometimes we'll just use the reference from somewhere else if it's fully covered somewhere else. Uh, but I will send out a link to the email list so that you can study fatwa from scholars who were very attentive to how the law would apply to someone living in America. Because it is different than how the law would apply to someone living in, say, Egypt or Pakistan. It's a different angle. Do you understand that concept? It goes right back to the point that the law of God, when he revealed to the prophet stuff, his attitude of what should be law and what are the priorities was different from Mecca to Medina. And there's a reason. Small minority surrounded by these people. Ability to control circumstances. Ability to not control circumstances. Priorities of developing faith and certainty and religion and identity and character development. And then over here now we've built all that. And so now we start to establish a legal system that you can formulate for your society and yourself and your family and all of that. So those are the steps that he goes in. It's mentioned like that in the Quran. Uh, yeah. So first they will hear about revelation. They will come to realize there's a revelation. Then yuzakihim. Then he will purify them from their sins and ego and desires and uh, bad character traits and all of that. Then will you alimu kitab wal hikmah. Then he will teach them.